I remember when I first started dreaming about being an author. And I thought about all the really cool parts about it. You know, all the dreamy parts, like how cool it is to be able to make a living from just your words and your imagination and the magical stories that you love to share with others, all of that good stuff. But almost as soon as I started being excited about all the potentially awesome stuff that could happen when I became a writer, I also started worrying about stuff that I absolutely should not have been worrying about. This is the thing that I notice with many of my clients and many writers I come across in my everyday life, in my writing group, all the other writing-related things that I happen to do, I realize that writers or aspiring authors are worrying way too much about things that really don't matter. So in this episode of the How to Be an Author podcast, I thought I would touch on these worries. The good news is that there is good news about the whole worrying thing, and we'll touch on that at the end of the episode. But the bad news is that worrying prevents you from writing because you spend so much time just getting in your own way that you end up never actually getting to the stage that you kind of were worrying about in the first place. I'm going to explain how that whole weird thing works, but I think that cutting out the worry in many ways when possible, if possible, is going to be your secret to actually moving forward and reaching the positive parts of that whole writing dream that you had. If you're a writer dreaming of becoming a successful author, join me, writing coach Karenna Akavane, on the How to Be an Author podcast, your weekly source for writing information, inspiration, and motivation. I'm so happy to have you here for this episode of the How to Be an Author podcast, because I think it's really important. I don't want you to feel that I'm ridiculing you when I'm talking about some of these fears that writers have or these things that writers worry about. And you'll hear me say, well, that's ridiculous or that's not realistic or whatever. But you need to realize this whole way as we talk about these things that I completely empathize. I completely understand that these are things that it's pretty much normal to worry about despite the fact that it's not so much a real problem that you're going to run into. And then some of these things can be a little problem, but we're going to have these workarounds for them. So for every single fear that you think you've had about your writing career, I hope that I'm going to put your mind at ease with today's episode. So let's get started. I'm going to start with one that's a little bit ridiculous, and this is one that I was really fighting with when I was younger. So I was fantasizing about being a famous author, but then I would also really freak out about potentially being recognized in the street and losing that sense of privacy and being forced to sell out and write these things for money and everything else. And these days, I think to myself, I should be so lucky, honestly. And Also, there's so many ways to avoid being recognized in the street, even if you're an absolute name brand writer. You know, you can use a pen name as long as you remember that you have to market your book no matter what, but also really the chances of getting recognized for your face instead of for your words it's not that high. So you can have an author picture that doesn't look much like you. You cannot give too many live interviews or video interviews and focus on being on podcasts so that people recognize your written words and your voice. And then that's it. You don't have to worry about walking into the local Starbucks and having a mob of people throwing themselves at you because you're a famous author. And really, if you think about it, I mean, for example, Let's take John Grisham. I mean, John Grisham, he's a famous author, right? He's a brand name, name brand, whatever you want to call it, author. I honestly don't think I would know John Grisham if he walked up to me in the street and said, I'm a writer, guess which one? Honestly, it would take me like a few guesses. So there's no way he's getting accosted unless, okay, unless it's the creepy people who are totally obsessed, in which case, again, 
don't put your picture out there too much. But like, look at J.K. Rowling. The only reason she's so recognizable is because of the number of interviews she gives and also because of the fact that, come on, let's be real. She is a one in a gazillion writer who is so uber successful that, you know, that's something that she chose for herself. So I would say, Before you finish writing your book, before you've sold a gazillion copies of your book, I think that worrying about being too famous and not having the life of your own, I'm thinking that that's a fear that's a little bit of a fake fear that's more of a little excuse for why you're not doing your best work. And in terms of selling out, again, we have choices. Let's pretend that you've written a book and that somebody's saying, you know, let's make this into a theme park and you don't want to do that. Okay, I would. Me, me, choose me. But if you don't want to do that, you have every right in the world. Writing at this point becomes a business and it's your choice whether you're going to be selling your work the way you want or whether you're willing to sell out in whichever way is available to you. But again, you should be so lucky to be in that position and then just stand up for yourself. I do think it's really important for writers to realize that you do have rights, that you don't have to say yes to everything that an agent or a publisher puts out there or says or does, and that it's important to have legal representation for yourself so that you do have someone who's in your corner and who's saying, no, this is not going to work for my client. So keep in mind that scrimping on A lawyer or scrimping on that agent representation may be not the best bet and always read any contract, but selling out is probably not something you need to worry about so, so much. Okay, here's my next fear that people have. A lot of people, when they want to work with me, and I'm like, great, okay, cool, well, send me your synopsis, send me your outline, send me the first couple chapters, or they'll ask me, you know, what am I supposed to do for my package that I'm sending to an agent? And I'm like, yeah, same thing, you know, they're probably whatever they ask for, the synopsis, including the ending, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, what if they steal my idea. Or they'll tell me like, how do I copyright my work before I send it to you? And to this, I say, baby, I promise I won't at all steal your work. I'm too busy not writing a bunch of my own stories. But And that's the same thing with a lot of writers. I mean, here's the simple fact. If there's a writer out there who falls in love with your idea so much that they're willing to drop everything and write that idea, spend the year or so that it takes to make that idea into a good book and that it ends up being exactly the same as you would have written, I would say that good for them, poo on you if you didn't get your book out there faster. But honestly, I don't think you need to worry so much about that possibility. It's, you know, it doesn't work that way. So I would say that things that are short form, like for example, if you said, I have an idea for a tweet. Yeah, okay. Somebody will steal that. I mean, you hear about comedians, for example, saying somebody stole my joke. Fair enough. It takes all of one minute to tell even a a kind of sophisticated joke. That's stealable. A book, not at all. Even if you're pitching a movie idea, it's still a lot of work involved. And for somebody to flesh that out, I mean, how much about this idea did you tell these people? If you're telling, and this is like the diamond industry in New York, for example, people will say, well, how do I know the diamonds are real? It's about reputation. So if you're going to go to a professional with a reputation with your book idea, it is their professional reputation on the line. They're not going to steal your idea or do anything else that's unprofessional because that means that their reputation is shot. It's the same thing with those diamond dealers in New York. If they sold a fake diamond, everyone would know about it really fast. And guess who's not a diamond dealer anymore? them. Same goes for your agent. Same goes for your editor. Guess who's not going to have much of a career once the first writer they stole from starts complaining about it all over the internet. And that's the beautiful thing, by the way, is before you hire a professional, look and see if they're a scam artist. Look and see if they are who they say they are. And you can definitely find that online. You know, do they have a website? Do they have social media presence? You know, all of these things help you to see that these people are actually who they say they are. And it's probably going to put your mind at ease that nobody's going to be stealing that idea of yours. And, you know, here's the thing. If you've got an idea and you can't motivate to write it and you're just telling it to everyone and then you do that thing where you're like, hey, I've got this great idea. Why don't you write it? And then we'll split the profits. 
baby, you have no idea what a tiny percentage of the creative process that first seed of an idea is. And that's where we get this other fear that's kind of adjacent to this, which is writers who really worry whether their idea is original enough. Oh my God, is my idea original enough? Oh no, I had this idea and then somebody had one kind of like it. Or, oh no, I was writing this book and then I read something that was kind of similar and I'm devastated. Here's the thing. Ideas in general are not that original anymore, right? There's so many writers on earth. There are story archetypes that are limited. You know, ideas are limited. What makes them special is your unique voice. And there's nobody who's going to manage to copy that as well as you can do for yourself. So I wouldn't worry about the originality of the idea. And moreover, if there's a book out there, like if you've just finished writing your book and all of a sudden you see that there's a book that has just been published that's really similar to what you wrote and it's doing really well, that's actually good news. That is proof of concept. And that's something where I tell you, bravo, strike while they aren't hot. Tell those agents, look at this book. It just came out. It's doing great. Mine is similar. It's not going to be identical. It's similar. And that proof of concept is what's going to show the agent that your idea is sellable. And that's what they're looking for. So that's really a great thing. So don't worry about the originality of your idea. And if you're feeling that, oh my God, this book just came out and it's really too similar to mine, like it's not only about dragons, but it's about dragons in New York and it's about these two characters and one is named Wendy. Well, guess what? Change Wendy's name, change the city, and you're golden. That's all that needs to be done. And a lot of these changes can be made through search and replace with your computer, and it's not going to be a big deal. A lot of writers also worry about the competition. They see these other writers succeeding, and they feel that, oh my God, that means that there's no more space for me to succeed. It's that whole limiting scarcity mindset where they think to themselves, just because my friend succeeded, I am now at the back of the line. Does that make any sense? It absolutely does not. The more people are succeeding, to me, that's the best sign out there that, yeah, people are still succeeding as writers. That's great news. There's still readers out there buying books, and maybe you're next. Maybe it's your turn. But you know what's going to prevent it from being your turn? 100% you worrying about the competition to the degree that you do not write your book. So many of these fears are absolutely not going to be something you need to worry about at all if you don't write your book. And that's the super huge irony of it. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy aspect of these fears. And I just feel like these are not fears, they're excuses in a way. And I'm absolutely, once again, I'm absolutely not mocking you or you know insulting you in any way because I have been there, which is why I was able to make this list so fast. You know, I was worried about the competition. Oh my God, you know, this person I vaguely know, a friend of a friend of a friend, got a writing contract. Well, there goes my chances. How silly is that? That means, hey, maybe if their book's similar, I should approach that agent too and mention that I know that person. If they like that person's book, maybe we have something in common. Maybe they'll like mine. That's the way to look at it, right? Look at everything as not competition, but an opportunity. And if there's somebody, let's say that there's a writer out there that you love to hate. Let's say that there's a writer out there that you see as competition. And like you notice to yourself that you're kind of hate scrolling through their socials and you're reading their books and being super insulting, but you're kind of rage reading that stuff. I think that might be a sign. I think that might be an opportunity for you to see that there's something triggering about that. Why? Is that triggering because you want to be like them? Is there something about their presence or their identity that makes you feel less than in some way? What's making you feel that way? I think it's really important when you're having these emotions that seem like they're not making that much sense. You want to look at the base and look at what it means. And always when you're having these emotions, the whole point is don't react at least not right away, look at them as an opportunity to act in a logical and concerted manner that's going to move you forward. I think that's 
so important. Um, so look at that. And I think that that idea alone for me was a huge change. That was something that made all the difference in learning to move forward, learning not to fear this competition thing, learning not to be using some things that are unrealistic as excuses. Okay, here's another cute little thing that writers worry way too much about. They worry about what their cover is going to look like. And even more, some writers who are doing like kids books or something, they worry about who is going to make the art for it. Now, if you know anything about printing, if you're trying to go with conventional publishing, you have pretty close to zero say what your cover is going to look like and who the illustrator is going to be. So this is something important for you to know. So if you are conventionally publishing, that cover, totally not anything to do with you unless, I mean, who knows, unless there's a miracle and somebody's like, hey, do you have an idea for what the cover is going to be? And then you can weigh in. But usually the cover is marketing. The cover is the art department. That's not you. In fact, I might extend it to saying that your title might be changed on you, which is why I always call my titles and my books a working title, because I know that those things might change multiple times before you're ready to publish, regardless of whether you're conventionally publishing or if you're self-publishing. That title is going to be the last minute decision. And the cover, same thing. Many authors are married to a certain cover or a certain style. And by the time their book comes out, that cover is looking dated. Or by the time their book comes out, the whole premise of the book has changed a little bit. And now the cover is not really working. Or sometimes writers will tell me like, well, I paid for this cover design. And, you know, full disclosure, usually they paid for it on Fiverr. So come on, give me a break. You can get a new cover. But people get married to these covers that aren't actually optimal. So I'm saying, you know, don't get married to one cover. Be open to different covers. Be open to A-B testing a couple different covers to see which one works best. Because here's an important thing to realize. You don't need to worry about your cover right now before you finish writing. But... You do need to think about your cover at some point if you're self-publishing because your cover is literally one of the hooks for your novel. It's one of the things that is going to instantly make a reader think that they either want to read your book or not read your book. So you don't want a cover that looks cheap or that looks amateur or that looks too similar to others or that doesn't look like it belongs in your genre. There's so many things about the covers that you need to be careful about, but don't be worrying about it when you still haven't finished the rough draft. That's just all I'm saying. And also, if you get a huge publishing deal with one of the top publishers and you're that pain in the ass author who's like, oh my God, I don't like the cover. I'm going to micromanage everything and I'm going to, you know, you might not have a publishing deal by the time you're done. So really weigh those decisions and weigh those thoughts that you're having and put it into perspective and think to yourself, really, am I the expert who's going to decide on this cover or not? Another thing I see writers agonizing over, and it's kind of funny, it's names of chapters. Like if you're not numbering your chapters and you're trying to give them cutesy or poetic names, like that's cool, I guess, if you're self-publishing and if your friends, you know, think you're really cool and artistic, but really in general, number your chapters. Who cares about the names of your chapters? Especially if it doesn't really have that much to do with what's going on in the chapter. And sometimes I just want to read the chapter. I want to know what's going to happen in the chapter when I read it. I don't want the title to tell me when George does this, or I don't want the title to be, you know, uh, the wild goat in the cherry orchard, like things that don't mean anything. I don't want that as a title, no matter how poetic you think it is. I think that that's not really essential. And I know that some authors, and I wouldn't be saying this, like if you don't do this, you probably think like, what is she talking about? But really, I know authors who agonize over these titles of chapters and they worry about them and it impacts them in a way that they don't finish their book. So that's pretty, pretty wild. Um, Another thing that so many authors worry about, and I really wish you wouldn't, is how bad your writing is. Listen, this is what I have to say about that. Like, does your writing suck in your first draft? Probably. Honestly, like I read my first draft or I read things I wrote a few years ago and I'm like, oh, I'm shuddering. This is so bad. It is embarrassing how bad it is. And 
that's just proof that we're learning and growing as writers. We all start off somewhere unless we're a prodigy of some type. But quite honestly, I would rather be the person who's learned a lot along the way than the prodigy for whom it was just easy and who doesn't sit there and suffer as they're writing and who has no self-doubt. I think that it's nice to have at least some degree of humility in our craft and also to see it as a craft and not just something that just spews out of us uh, fully formed, perfect and everything else. So don't worry about how bad your writing is. If you want to be a writer, if you've got this calling to be a writer, if you've got this book inside of you, I can bet you that you're going to figure out a way to make your writing just perfectly good enough for your reader. And that's the other thing is maybe your writing's not what you had hoped it would be. Maybe you thought your writing was going to be this poetic thing. And instead, it's something that's just good storytelling. And you're not getting the audience that you thought you would get, but you're getting a fantastic audience that's different than that. And they're raving fans. I think just wake up and say, you know, maybe this is what it was meant to be. I'm still a writer. I'm still a good writer. I'm just not exactly the writer that maybe I thought I was going to be, or maybe somebody told me I should aspire to. Sometimes we look at other writers and we think, oh, this is what a real writer is. This is how a real writer does it. This is how a real writer sounds like. And we end up feeling bad and we end up sabotaging ourselves and we end up over ed- editing our text and, you know, delaying everything. But really, sometimes what we think is bad writing is writing that can be helped. And sometimes some of the things that we think is like, oh, this is ugly and this is this. That's the thing that actually speaks to your reader. So don't ask yourself how bad your writing is. Hire an editor or ask your beta readers. And also when you do that, take some of that advice with a grain of salt. After all, this is your book. So there's some things where we're blind to how bad our writing actually is, and that's totally fine. It happens to all of us. But some writers I know will fight their agent or they'll fight their editor or they'll fight their writing coach, me, and they'll be like, no, I'm doing it this way. And, you know, that's why I have to be really kind and say, listen, I'm not trying to make it something that it's not because that's the big fear. That's another fear. What if somebody makes me make my book something that it's not? And again, that's something where you have a choice. You could decide to say, no, I don't go with that change. But the only changes I tend to make are the changes that I think will actually just make that book the best version of itself that it can possibly be. And I edit for clarity. I edit for the strength of the story and the character and story arc. And that's what I do. I'm not trying to make your book into something that I would have written. I'm just really trying to make you find your voice as a writer. So that's really important. Um, Another thing that writers really worry about is putting themselves out there and having to market their book. And I've seen this advice. What's interesting was that I was researching this episode and I was thinking, you know, well, you know, a lot of writers worry about that and they don't want to do that. So that kind of slows them down and everything else. And I've seen advice where other writers or writing coaches or editors will say, yeah, don't worry. You don't have to worry about that. Um, You should just be thinking about writing and you don't need to be thinking about it when you're not, you know, done with your book. Actually, I think that that's not true. I think that you do need to start building your platform as early as possible, maybe even before you started writing your book or when you just start writing your book. But I want you to not worry about it too much. So if you know that you have this super anxiety about putting yourself out there and about marketing, take it slow. Take it easy. Don't push it too hard. The sooner you start, the more easy peasy you can start and the more you can try to practice those things that don't feel yucky. You don't want to be too salesy. Great. But start building a mailing list as you go. And the sooner you start trying this, the sooner you'll see the things that work and the things that don't work in terms of building your audience. And before you know it, that audience builds and builds. And this is a really useful thing for you. And it doesn't have to be that scary. And also, the more you put yourself out there, baby steps, the more comfortable it gets. Like, believe me, you think I want to put myself out there all the time? Actually, now I don't even care. Now I don't even really think about it that much. That's because I've had years of putting myself out there. At first, it was terrifying. At first, it was really mortifying. And now it's something that just comes more and more easily. And now I almost have to remind myself that like, hey, you know what? Actually, it does matter if you're acting like a clown in the public forum. So now I need to kind of rein myself in. Maybe, maybe. I'm not even sure. But for you, don't be worrying about it, but do be 
thinking about it. Okay, now here's a big fear that so many writers have, and that fear is fear of rejection. And I get it. There's so much fear of rejection because rejection is part and parcel of this whole writing thing. You put yourself out there, you're going to get rejected by someone at some point. Like you're not going to get into that literary journal or you're not going to get accepted by this agent. You know, this publisher is not going to want to publish your book or they're not going to want to, you know, promote your book on whatever. Rejection happens. And also the negative reviews are part of this as well. You know, oh my God, what if I get a negative review on my book? Well, guess what? Okay. You can't please everyone, first of all. So you're going to get rejected. First of all, this is a business. So you can't force somebody to spend money on you if they don't fully believe in it or stand by it or that they don't feel it's speaking to them. This is not a personal thing at all. It's a business decision of, is this something I want to pay for? Or is this something that I think people would want to pay for? Or is this something that I stand behind? And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So you need to realize that your book, it can't be accepted all the time or praised all the time just because it's your special baby that you worked on really hard. So I've had some authors that I work with who I think are delightful and I see and I want to really, again, I want to put a little um, warning on this where I've had authors where they've written something and I've been like, you know, I see where you're trying to go with this, but the story really isn't where it should be. And, you know, literally there's no agent who would ever take this on. And this is something that's objective because, you know, there are some things that are opinion. For example, the subject of your book. Somebody's going to say, nobody's going to want anything about dragons. And somebody else is going to say, oh my God, I love dragons. Okay, that's an opinion. However, if your story is written in a way that your reader cannot understand what's happening in the story, that's 100% not opinion. That's fact. That's something that an agent's not going to want. So I've had to tell some writer clients, you know, this is not working. And they'll say, but I worked so hard on this. I don't think I need to work on it anymore. To which I say, well, that's your choice. You can choose to be rejected. You can choose to have your book go nowhere. Or you can choose to do the extra work that's needed to make your book into something that's going to be not only accepted, but celebrated by agents, by readers, by whatever. So I think that's a really important thing to realize that rejection is just a step in the journey. Rejection should be something that you plan for. I mean, you should tell yourself, okay, if I get rejected X amount of times, what do I do then? So I've told some of these writers who are like, I don't want to put the work in because I work so hard. And I'll be like, okay, let's make a plan. Let's make a plan. Let's send this to 20 agents. And if you get 20 rejections, can we both agree that maybe you need to rework your book? That's a deal that you can make with either your writing coach or with yourself. I think it's good to have a plan of how am I going to react when I get these rejections? Same thing goes for negative reviews. First of all, negative reviews, I think to myself, it's so hard to get a review in the first place. I'm like, yay, negative attention is attention in a way. And you can start like negative reviews are the opportunity to start a conversation about your book and about your work. And you can, you know, try to defend yourself and you can try to get into this discussion and you can be like, let's debate this. And that can make some advertising about your work. I mean, oftentimes when something's controversial, it's going to have more success than something that just kind of slides under that radar and nobody hears about it because it wasn't that good or that bad. Okay, now let's talk about why worrying isn't necessarily that bad. I mean, it is bad, but it's not. Um, Studies have linked worry with creativity. Creative people tend to worry more because we have that imagination. We can see the worst case scenario. It's kind of part of our job description to be worry words about everything because we're seeing all these different angles at once. So the more you worry, probably the more creative you are. But I don't want this to slip into anxiety and catastrophizing and future tripping. All of these things are not helpful at all. You know, failure to me only means that you're kind of a badass who tried right? And now what do you do about the failure? How are we going to act on this rather than just reacting? So we talked about catastrophizing. How do we use that to make our worries kind of evaporate a little bit? I like to play this game that is called what's the worst that can happen. So I have my writers write down every one of their worst fears about their writing. 
And then we go down the rabbit hole. But what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? What's the worst that can happen? And you can get really ridiculous, right? Like, okay, my book's going to get rejected by an agent. Oh, boo-hoo, okay. Well, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the agent could call every single agent they know and tell them how horrible my book is. Okay, well, then what does that mean? Well, then every single agent that I approach is going to, you know, tell their friends too, and then the whole world is going to know to avoid my book. It's like, really, is that going to happen? I don't think so. Agents are pretty busy, but even if it did, what would you do about this? What does this mean for you? And also, there's something about having the worst book on earth. I mean, I don't know. That sounds kind of funny to me. But seriously, what's the worst that could happen, right? What if you get a bad feedback on your conclusion of your book? What's the worst that could happen? The worst that could happen is you're going to stop writing, right? That's the worst thing that could happen. So that's really the moral of this is what's the worst that could happen is usually tied to you not writing anymore. Or what's the worst that can happen devolves into something that's so ridiculous that it's like, well, that's not going to happen. You see what I mean by that? So I think play this game, write down your worries, just write them down and kind of laugh at them or take them to their natural progression of what's realistically going to happen or what's going to be totally crazy to happen and play that game and then tell yourself, is this worth not having my writing career over? Is this worth making excuses that are going to prevent me from even being in a position where these fears actually mean something and can actually impact me? So that's it. I hope that this helps today. Um, I think that it's really crucial for authors to have a healthy mindset. So I think that this is something where you might feel that like, hey, I'm not that crazy. And hey, I've got some actionable tips on how not to spiral out of control with my worry about things that, you know, maybe ultimately don't matter as much as I thought they did. There you go. So thank you so much for joining me on the How to Be an Author podcast. I look really forward to being with you next time as we talk about some other useful aspect of the writer's life. And if you're hungry for more How to Be an Author and writing coach material, please sign up on my website, www.creativeandwritingcoach.com, so that you can get my newsletter full of inspiration to your mailbox every week. And you'll also get info about writing groups and about the courses that I have coming up. And I also invite you to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. Thank you again and keep on writing. If you have any pressing writing related questions or would like to be featured on the How to Be an Author podcast, please feel free to reach out on my website, creativeandwritingcoach.com.